of these meetings. They did a good job. Often I pray that from this church, from this congregation, several, maybe one or several young men can uh, become gospel preachers, evangelists, ministers of the word. Be amazing, and God can do that. In the summer, I will have preached for 49 years. I started preaching three months after my baptism. I was 21 years old. It's never too early. Maybe not five, but a little bit older, but still, never too early. We have a lot of young people here, and I think there's a great potential. I'm thankful to God for that. So thank you for this reading. In Philippians, uh, Paul deals, I think, with two central themes. One is joy, rejoicing, which is repeated several times. And the other is our heavenly kingdom, our heavenly realm, or our citizenship in heaven. I think the two are connected. Uh, there is a joy in rejoicing because there is something after death. Death is not the end of the story. And so these two are connected. That's what we're going to look at. In the first text that we read in Philippians 1, beginning in verse 18, all the way to 26, if you look at these verses, you will notice that uh, it's introduced by joy, and it, can, it and the end, the last verse, also talks about joy. Paul begins, yes, and I will rejoice. And then he explains why. And then in verse uh, 26, uh, uh, no, in verse 25, excuse me, I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. And so the language of Paul here he talks about death quite a bit because he is in prison in Rome and he's kind of at the end of his life to some extent. And he starts why he talks about his death. But he does say in this letter that he will not die right away, that he will have some more time. The language of Paul is interesting because he talks about uh, death as a departure. This is not a normal way to talk about death. When, you, when, you're, when you're dying, you're dying. And that's the way we look at it. But he doesn't talk at it like that. He says he's departing, he's leaving. And this is a language used like for somebody getting in a car or, a, or in an airplane or a train to go somewhere. Uh, it, doesn't indicate, it doesn't indicate the end. It indicates a travel. You're going somewhere. And I want to talk about that because I think that's interesting. Uh, I compare life to a hotel. Uh, there's two, two places you live if you travel a lot. I did, I did a lot of traveling in the past. You, you, you live in your house and you live in the hotel. Well, you know, when I go to the hotel, I usually have a suitcase. Unless I go for one night, I don't need one. I, you have a suitcase if I go for a few nights. And I don't know if it's, it's your experience, but when I'm in the hotel with my suitcase, I live out of my suitcase. I never take the clothes in my suitcase and put them in those places that are planned, you know, hotel, all these places to put your clothes. I don't know if you do that, but I never do that. I leave that in my suitcase. Why is that? Because I'm only there for a day or two. And so I don't need to do all of that. And that's how I compare our life here. We're like a coming through. We're transitioning. We're traveling through and we're going somewhere else. There's another uh, destiny for us. So. Christ, uh, he says, for me, uh, to die is to depart and be with Christ. So he, the image is, I'm taking a train or something, and I'm traveling, and I'm going to meet Christ. It's not really what we think of death. Uh, why does he say, I depart and be with Christ? Well, because Christ is alive. That's why. Christ from the, rose from the dead, and he is alive today in the heavenly realms. And we'll talk about what that means, the heavenly realms. He is alive, and when we die, we, we kind of take a train. We, we kind of depart. In other words, we remain who we are with a, re, a realization of what is going on. We have understanding of what's happening. We have experience of life to the fullest, to much more than we have uh, right now, experience of life. And then we are with Christ. So that's, uh, that's true. And also remember that Jesus made a promise. He says, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So Christ is present. Uh, Christ could appear here right now if he wanted to. And he's done that, in fact. You see that in the book of Acts a few times. In the, he, Christ appears. He just comes and appears uh, and, and goes back. 
so he can travel he can travel back and forth from heaven to our re our reality in our earth uh, so Paul begins by saying I will rejoice and then he talks about joy in the faith so that is a cent central theme now the second passage we read is in uh, Philippians 3 17 chapter 4 through 1 again uh, that talks also of, uh, about joy but here it talks more about heaven and I want you to notice what he says about heaven here something I noticed uh, this is interesting in verse 20 chapter 3 uh, our citizenship is in heaven uh, and from it we await a savior the Lord Jesus Christ so uh, heaven here is a place from which Jesus comes when he returns he is somewhere and he comes and he says we wait from him we wait for Jesus so he's in this place called heaven it's other, it has other names the kingdom of God the eternal kingdom of God also called the heavenly places uh, in first Timothy 6 actually Paul describes it uh, as an unapproachable light that no one has ever seen or can see uh, an interesting passage uh, is, is Ephesians where it talks about heaven there Ephesians 1 and verse 20 so God raised Christ from the dead and he says in verse 20 he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places but notice verse 21 because that gives a clue to heaven a uh, more important understanding verse 21 he says heaven far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named so what do we learn from heaven here from the heavenly places we learn something very important is that the heavenly places or the realm of God that light where God lives is the source of all power dominion and authority here's what this means heaven is the place from which the universe came the creation of the world came from God God, it preceded, heaven preceded the earth. Heaven's always been there. The, the, the world of God has always been there. And from that power, that source of power, God created the universe. It took a lot of power to create the universe and life. Uh, it's also from heaven, from that power, that God raised Jesus from the dead. It's from heaven, the power of heaven, that God, that Jesus was able to uh, raise the dead multiply the bread the bread and the fish and do change the water into wine it's from that power that has its source in heaven so in the bible whenever people get a glimpse that happens from time to time when people get a glimpse of heaven of, of god's realm they are full of joy and paul even says that he was caught up into heaven and he couldn't even describe with words how he felt and from that day on, I'm sure that he wanted to be back there. So that's the idea. You talk about uh, joy. In, in John, Jesus uh, is about to, to be on the cross, but he talks about joy in that context. Let's look at a few verses. John 16 and verse 20. Here's what he says to them. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament. He's talking about he's going to be crucified. He's going to be dying on the cross. But the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will jo turn into joy. Okay? Verse 22, it repeats the same thing. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. What is he talking about? He's talking about that he's going to be on the cross, but as he had promised them also before, on the third day he would rise from the dead and when they see him and they eat even with him and they fellowship with him risen they will have so much joy that nothing can take that away see the contrast between the cross the pain the sorrowfulness and just three year, three days later an overwhelming joy because he is risen from the dead and he is alive now uh, in front of them so heaven in chapter 3 and verse 20 of Philippians, we go back to Philippians, we're kind of jumping from one verse to another here. Heaven in chapter 3 verse 20 of Philippians, he says, from which we wait a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. That's what I'm talking about. Heaven, the God's realm being the source of all power 
that created the universe, that were, from which Christ was able to perform miracles, that raised Jesus from the dead, is that power will also uh, produce the resurrection at the end. So it is the source of all power, and from which life is sustained even today, and from which Christ will return. So, it is far better, he says, Paul, to be with Christ uh, than to remain. But he says, I will remain still. The conclusion of uh, these passages we read is very important. It's chapter 4, verse 1. Now, chapter 3 is kind of uh, cut off with chapter 4, but it, it's a continuation. The reason it's continuation is because we have the word, therefore. It's an important word. Verse, verse 1, chapter 4, therefore, my brothers, my brethren, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Stand firm in the love, in the Lord. Because there is good reason for us to have faith and to have hope. Because the resurrection of Jesus is not just a thought or an idea like that. It was proven by many witnesses. It was announced in the Old Testament. It was proven by so many witnesses who saw Christ uh, arise, who risen, alive. So he said, because of that, he says, stand firm in the Lord. Often, we, we are not firm in our faith. We, we get discouraged in our faith. We do the wrong thing. I think because we have forgotten maybe this focus on heaven. We have forgotten that we are here uh, transitioning. We are here on a travel. We are we're traveling to a greater destination. We are living as if it's only this life on earth. When we do that, when we live as if this is the only life we have, this is the only time we have to be happy and to do anything worth it, there's nothing beyond, we're in big trouble. I think that's when we begin to really do the wrong thing. So I think these exhortations by Paul are meant for the Philippians, to, like he says, to be firm in their faith, not to hang on to these things of, of this earth, of this life, but to have this vision of heaven. But not only that, we need to understand that we need the power of God in our life. We are not able to be faithful and to sustain ourselves just by will, just by, by, because we want to, just because we want to attend the church or whatever. We need the power of God in order to be faithful. When we're in the school and challenged with other students or other kids, you know, that maybe they, who knows what they say to us. Well, in those situations, we need the power of God. When we are in, a, in our job and we're dealing with difficult people, we need the power of God to deal with these people. And we could all go on and on and on like that in our situations. When we forget that heaven is real, God is real, he intervenes, he's there for us, his power is available to us, I think that we are really not in very good shape. We're not going to make it. I think that's the reason that Paul mentions so often in his epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, others, that we have the power of God at our disposition. It doesn't mean that we can do anything we want with it, because it's not the case. But we do have at our disposition the power of God when that, that is there to help us in this life. So this is the reason we pray. We pray because when we come to God, when God sees that we give time for him, that we are able to make silence around us and be with God for a certain amount of time, when God sees that, I believe then he opens the doors of heaven to us. And you remember this very important text of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, that if we want the door open, what do we need to do? Can someone tell me? When we want the door open, what do we need to do to, to knock? When we want to find something, what would we need to do? To seek. And so this is, this is the idea, that we have heaven right there at our disposition. We have God there. And we need his power every day to be faithful. And so we can be encouraged that we have citizenship in heaven. This is our final destination. This is what we are meant to live for. We are meant to live for heaven, not to live so much for the things of this earth. And so we have a lot of things that we can do. Paul says, I need to remain because I have a lot of things to do yet. He says, but I'm going at some point. But I'm remaining now for your good. 
because I'm here to serve you and to help you. So what does that mean? We're not here for ourselves. It goes back to what I said about Second Corinthians, the passage there which says, we're not to live for ourselves, but we're to live for Christ. So let's find out, each one of us, what God is putting in front of us, each one of us, to help, to serve, to do good, to be useful to his kingdom. It might be different for each one, but let's look for that. And then let's seek God's help, God's power, that we can accomplish whatever we have to do while we're still here. So we're not just waiting, you know, and how do you say, we say, roulez les pouces in French. The thumbs go like that. Yes. And an expression, I forgot what it is. Roulez les pouces. That's what I say. It's French. You got to learn French. With me, impossible to follow if you don't follow, if you don't learn French. But, you know, we're not there for that. We're there because we have a mission. And who knows that through our service and through our encouragement and through our words, we will be help, able to help a lot of people to get to heaven. Because that's our role too. That's our that's our task is to help people get to heaven, get connected to God, and live truly. And whenever they die, they're not going to die; they're going to depart to be with Christ. And Christ is coming back too. That's so encouraging to know that Christ is coming, and He has a lot of power. He can do anything He wants. The power of God is called all power. For us, it's hard to imagine all power. But there is nothing that can limit God in what he can do. He is absolutely all power of Shaddai. That's the God we believe in. Not limited, not restrained, not limited by anything. He is all powerful. And look what God can do through us if we appeal to his power and if we pray and spend time with him. So that's my encouragement for this morning. We're going to have a song of invitation, and it's a good thing. We do need to start. To go to heaven, we need to get to, to begin somewhere, and we begin when we have faith in Jesus. Uh, when we turn to God, we repent. When we're immersed and baptized into His name for the forgiveness of sins, we receive the Holy Spirit, the power of God in us to grow and produce fruit. That's the start. But all of us who have been immersed, baptized, we're in the race now, and we need to keep on running until the end. So we can have that crown that he talks about also in these passages. So God bless you and get, let's, let's pray as a church individually, collectively. Let's pray as a church. Let's be in the word. Let's be a church that really, really is in the word of God and really is seeking to serve God. And we are in that direction, but let's persevere. Let's continue. Let's not get discouraged. Let nobody stop you uh, or discourage you. That's my call. So we're going to sing up and, and sing this song of invitation.